right, so I just want to say uh, hello once again to everybody that's, that's joining us uh, this, this Thursday. And uh, if you have not already guessed, uh, uh, you know, Jack Lee is not heavier and paler. Um, I'm Mark Brando. <laughs> I am filling in for Jack today. Um, we, uh, we have a lot to get through. And, and, you know, somebody had already asked, are we going to be discussing, you know, what's going on with the latest in our COVID research, given all the news that we're hearing about our Delta variant? And the answer is unequivocally yes. Uh, when we saw, you know, things kind of starting to really change, uh, even before things like LA County putting dining restrictions back in, we thought, well, you know, we're not done with code research. It's not done with us. So we definitely have the latest for you there. But uh, that's, that's not it. There's actually kind of a lot of other really fun stuff from the, the culinary world to get through. Um, you know, things that are new in uh, food service and technology, um, some emerging culinary trends from, from Carly today. So we're glad you guys are, are here with us and uh, spending some time, uh, you know, kind of during these, these summer months. Uh, you know, typically it can be some of the doldrums, but not, not right now and, and not lately. So we'll get started. Now, most of you guys uh, know the drill, but if you are joining us for the first time, welcome. And we uh, really encourage you guys to give us a lot of feedback, to participate, um, you know, join in the discussion as much as you can. And if you want to do that, make sure that your comments are, your settings are set to all panelists and attendees. So that way everybody can kind of uh, follow along, along with what you're saying. And uh, we have a really robust conversation going. We think that's really one of the best parts about uh, these, uh, these webinars we've been doing every two weeks. Um, and actually one of the really, one of the better parts is uh, the fact that Mike Costio has <laughs> one of the best jobs in the country, which is that <laughs> He gets just to talk about stuff that he sees and what he finds interesting. And <laughs> as our resident trendologist, um, you know, he's, he's in the enviable position of uh, kind of just showing us what's going on. So Mike, I wanted to let you start us off with kind of the cool stuff that you're seeing, starting, starting with this. Yeah, I am lucky. I get to just get, talk about the fun stuff that's out there. Um, and I, this is, so I wanted to ask everybody that was calling in today, if they had a chance to purchase this, because I don't know if you watched our uh, webinar earlier in the year that looked at 2021 trends. One of the sections in that webinar was looking at some of the social media influencers who are impacting the food industry, who are impacting what consumers were buying. And one of our favorites at Data Central is Tabitha Brown. She's a TikTok star. Um, she's actually an actress. She's on a number of shows right now. Um, she has a YouTube channel. And she is so popular that McCormick actually partnered with her to create her own seasoning blend, which is called Sunshine. They launched it a couple weeks ago and it sold out in 39 minutes is how popular she is at this point. So the seasoning blend itself is a salt-free blend. It includes garlic powder, ginger, thyme, turmeric, allspice. And then I think the interesting thing is that it includes mango and pineapple powder as well. So I don't know, I feel like we see mushroom powder used in a lot of mixes, but we don't necessarily see fruit powders used a lot. So I think that's interesting. Now, I mean, you can find like two packs of them on eBay for $120. I mean, like it's, there's a black market for her blend. Like they are going to come out with like another batch of them in the fall. But um, I mean, you could just see, you know, like these TikTok influencers are really impacting the food industry. now. It's all a part of late capitalism. <laughs> I think it sounds good. I think that like the blend sounds really delicious. Um, and I wish her all the success in the industry. She's a genuinely, genuinely nice person. And then this, uh, you posted, uh, we saw this posted um, on our internal Slack channel a number of times. I think you posted this to the company Slack channel, Carly. Uh, but this is Kraftwerk. So another collaboration, but in this case, Kraftwerk with Van Leeuwen ice creams to come up with this Kraft macaroni and cheese ice cream which is one of those things that immediately just kind of feels like an attention getter that won't necessarily be delicious. But actually the reviews have been uniformly positive for this. Like I think the takeout gave it an A, Eater said it was super delicious and they ate half the container in one sitting. Um, there's a, a real push right now to actually turn this into a permanent product. I think you can purchase it online. It's a pretty limited, it's 12 bucks a pint. And then they were doing it at their scoop shops and giving um, some, I, I believe, away uh, on their food truck in New York. But uh, it seems to be pretty successful. I think the color, I mean, like, obviously I haven't had a chance to taste it. The color is very successful. It really yeah. does remind you of Kraft macaroni and cheese. Um, but I don't know, just kind of an interesting, fun little, uh, you know, marketing initiative that kind of had legs because actually it tastes good. 
And then, so I, you know, everybody's opening uh, back up now. So this is Serendipity Three in New York. If you know them, you probably know them because they do the frozen hot chocolate. Um, so that's what they're kind of famous for. But they reopened on July 9th. And then a couple of days later was National French Friday. So they wanted to do something really big to market themselves, to get, you know, attention as they reopened. So they created this, which is the Guinness World Record holding world's most expensive French fries. They're $200. They only launched them on National French Friday, July 13th. And I'm going to read what goes into them because there's no way I could memorize all of this. So they are chipper Beck potatoes, which are blanched in Dom Perignon champagne and French champagne vinegar. They're cooked three times in goose fat made from cage-free French geese. They're seasoned with hand-harvested French truffle salt, tossed with truffle oil, topped with shaved pecorino made from milk, um, and the sheep that give that milk graze in truffle forests. They're topped with Italian shaved black truffles, served with a Mornay sauce made from Jersey cow cream, black truffle butter, and Gruyere raclette. And then they're served in a baccarat plate and bowl and sprinkled with edible gold dust. So uh, they got a lot of attention, um, you know, just kind of a really cool way of reopening, um, you know, as restaurants get back to normal. You think anybody ordered it? I don't know. I'm sure in New York, I'm sure there were people that ordered it. <laughs> I mean, there's, I, I'm sure if you look on TikTok and Instagram, there's a ton of people that want to show off that they ordered it. This is another thing that we talked about internally. You may have seen this product previously because it's been around for a while. So the guy who started this company um, started it, I think he had the ideas in the 90s. He started the company in the 2000s. He actually got caught up in a weird Ponzi scheme. He, uh, you know, kind of took a little break from the company. He relaunched it on Indiegogo in 2016, um, earned $12,000 from that campaign, um, actually took a little bit of a break again. And now he's coming back for the third time with this, which is a peanut butter and jelly in a can product, which sounds weird. I mean, like it, when we put it on the Slack channel at work, everybody thought it sounded like a little gross, but really it's just a kit. So, I mean, it's just like the, you know, the bread and the peanut butter and jelly in those little packets that you see on the side in the can here. But the reason he's relaunching now is he said that there's such an interest in all these food driven vending machines. So all these dorms across the country, all these airports want to put these food vending machines in. But he said most of the vending machines out there are actually the old style can vending machines that just serve, you know, cans of Pepsi and Coke and things like that. So his product is specifically designed to be used in those machines. So it's actually the exact size of a can so you can use those millions of old vending machines um, to sell um, actually food products. And he's going to launch other. I, right now, he just has the two peanut butter and jelly options. But I think he said next are pizza. And then he wants to do like a barbecue chicken sandwich um, as another version. And the technology for the bread is based on MRE technology. So it does keep the bread um, you know, shelf stable for, I believe, it's a year. Um, so he, he cross promotes it to both like college students and young people and to the prepper community. So whether you're a young kid or you're a doomsday prepper, you know, maybe canned witches are the product for you. There was a guy in my dorm who was both. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, I mean, you, if you've come to Foodscape, if you've watched our, you know, trend presentations over the past probably three to four years at this point, you know, we've been talking about, you know, the next iteration of plant-based is going to be chicken, um, you know, after the whole burger explosion. And I think just in the past two weeks, the number of new plant-based chicken launches like really just exploded. So we saw Beyond, they released their chicken tenders in 400 restaurants across the country. Impossible announced that they're going to be coming out with their chicken product in the fall. Uh, but one of the biggest launches was this from um, Panda Express. They actually worked directly with um, Beyond Meats to develop this, which is their Beyond the Original Orange Chicken. So it's a plant-based version of their orange chicken that's launching um, in two markets uh, in the country right now. So it's not a full national launch at this point. I, I mean, as we keep saying, you know, if you look in our flavor database, chicken is the food that consumers report having eaten the most um, after like American food overall. So, you know, this explosion of plant-based chicken products, um, you know, really has the potential of making a big impact on the industry. And then along the same lines, you know, kind of the next, um, you know, uh, opportunity past chicken is seafood. So we're seeing, you know, Carly's talked about this a number of times, all these, you know, new seafood products that are out there. But Long John Silver says that they're the first national seafood chain to launch um, the plant-based um, fish and crab cake products. So they worked with 
um, Good Catch, which is a plant-based seafood company to launch um, fish and crab cake products. In a few locations right now, the products are made from um, peas, chickpeas, lentils, soy, fava beans, and navy beans. So they are pretty much legume based, um, but they say they have that, that kind of same flaky texture that you um, really expect from getting from seafood. And uh, Good Catch was actually just on the news and actually got a cease and desist letter from Subway. Uh, they were doing a food truck promotion with tuna sandwiches and they called it our way and the logo was stylized in the same oh. way as Subway. Because uh, yeah, it also, uh, you know, took a pot shot at the tuna debacle and Subway actually sent them a cease and desist letter, which they uh, posted on their Instagram. So um <laughs> some wars within the plant-based world. There's no bad press. <laughs> And then the, I don't, this, is, this is literally me just finding something interesting and talking about it to our audience. But and so I don't, for whatever reason, we've been doing a bunch of research into Boise, Idaho recently. And so we were looking at new openings in Boise, Idaho. Now one, uh, a new chain that had opened up in the city was this chain called Pizza Twist. And so this is a picture of a pizza on the Pizza Twist menu. I'd never heard of this chain before, so we looked it up. We have 50 locations across the country in every in market like huge markets like Pittsburgh and then like super small markets like Fishers, Indiana. And the interesting thing about them is that they're an Indian pizza chain. So the pizzas on the menu at this chain are all Indian inspired. So they do have traditional options too, like chicken bacon ranch. But then they also do like a chicken tikka masala pizza. They do a butter chicken pizza. Um, a lot of the pizzas use paneer instead of mozzarella. Their garlic bread is made with naan. Um, just, you know, a really interesting pizza chain that is growing. I think they say they're one of the fastest growing pizza chains in the country. And if you go to the next slide here, I think the interesting thing is they're not even the only one. So this is the only one that I was really familiar with before this, which is Pizza Walla. So, so this is, um, I think they actually only have one location in Michi Michigan, but they're really looking to expand pretty quickly here. Uh, their branding is beautiful. You can see here the boxes look really, really great. And same thing, they have a, uh, seven different paneer pizza options. They have tandoori chicken wings on the menu. Um, the appetizer menu includes a take on a samosa. Um, and they're not the only one either. In Texas, um, there's a, a small location called Fun Pizza Kitchen, which is the same thing. So I don't know. I just think this is an interesting little trend lit to see these Indian inspired pizza chains across the country. And it's something we'll probably keep an eye on into the future. That is a anybody... trend, there's no there's no national Indian food chain, really. Um, yeah. not, not too many. Yeah. The ones that we know of are, you know, in like the, the couple dozen locations and they're full service. Yeah, yeah. And when you look at the reviews for these, they're incredible. People love them. So um, there's a lot of opportunity here. Yeah, we talked about one um, last year called Curry on Crust just outside of Detroit too. And um, it, it is, it's just fascinating to see all the, you know, these flavors and classic Indian dishes that are actually really well suited for pizza. And it sounds like people are really enjoying the concept. And I might be wrong. So uh, pizza, Curry on Crust came up when we were looking at this. And Curry on Crust might actually be what Pizza Wallace is now. They might be the new name, but I'm not sure. If you look up Curry on Crust, the website doesn't exist anymore. Um, and uh, there's some mentions of it. So I don't know, uh, there, uh, there's a lot of you know things going on in the Indian inspired pizza world out there. Um, and then this, I had to mention it again. Uh, so last week or two weeks ago, if you listened in, we talked about these, which were the flat hot dogs from Rostelli's. And um, somebody was listening in on the webinar. If Linda's listening today, shout out to Linda. She reached out to her contact at Rostelli, said they mentioned it on the webinar. And the contact got in touch with us and they said, you know, we kind of missed one of the, the big selling points of this product, which is actually that um, this is really sad, but a lot of kids choke on hot dogs. So I guess there's um, something like 12,000 cases of kids choking and going to the ER over the case of the year. And a hot dog is kind of a, a perfect shape for a kid to choke on. So most doctors recommend that you cut up a hot dog. And um, I think they even said like something, almost 3% of those cases are specifically because of hot dogs. And so if you have this flat hot dog, you really don't have that issue anymore. So, and well, I mean, we just kind of covered it because it was interesting. You know, we talked about the fact that people were slicing their hot dogs open to get more surface area to grill on. Um, but that is another selling point of this product that is really interesting. Well, here in Chicago, that can hold a lot more, you know, sport peppers and, and everything else. Yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> you could really drag it <laughs> through the garden. And I think now this, you know, settles it that hot dogs have to go on the sandwich, Mac. 
<laughs> that's basically a sandwich. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm looking a at a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. That's all I have uh, as far as fun, weird stuff for this week. Yeah. Well, before we get into the debate on is a hot dog a sandwich, we should we should pivot pretty quickly um, to something that that is kind of on our minds, and that is uh, our, our our latest research on coronavirus. Um, you know, not that not that I thought I would be done researching this stuff completely, but I, I thought that we would have a bit of a reprieve for a little for a little while. But um, you know, events kind of have taken over, and the you know the news about this new uh, Delta strain of the coronavirus has has kind of been everywhere. I'm sure we've all seen the same headlines, where it's not just about the uh, increase in the hospital hospitalizations and, and cases and, and and deaths in some states. But it is going to affect a lot more than just our healthcare system. I think that, you know, we're looking at the energy markets where, um, you know, if there's a signal out there that uh, demand might be falling for things like oil and gasoline, um, then I think that we do have to kind of uh, think about a, a slowdown in demand kind of everywhere. Already, you know, LA County has uh, put mask recommendations back in place, even for vaccinated consumers, and they are almost definitely not the only one. I think we'll see more of that. Um, the Olympics is gonna be really interesting. You know, we're, we're seeing athletes from countries all over the place that are you know, being told they can't even compete anymore because of uh, health and COVID protocols. So um, you know, to say nothing of the fact that it's a, an event where the entire world is gathering in one place. So that's one thing we're gonna be watching too. To put it in some perspective here, uh, you know, this data is all of the new cases of coronavirus from the start, from you know January of 2020, and as you can see, we're well beyond, you know, the these couple of surges, especially that really scary third surge, um, you know, that was stretching from last winter into earlier this year. You know, we're over on the right side of this chart. Things are kind of going up, but we're not close to you know, the really scary numbers from before. But to zoom in a little bit, this is just the numbers from, from uh, this year, from 2021. Uh, you know, the, the cases kind of uh, you know, pogo up and down a little bit. They're a little bit higher. The line here on this chart, though, of uh, these are people who have been totally vaccinated, getting both shots. Um, it, it's starting to plateau a little bit. You know, nationwide, we are. Uh, you know, above 50%, but we, we didn't uh, get to that goal that we set for ourselves of about 70% by July 4th. The pace of vaccination is slowing down. And so we need to kind of start to look at reasons why and, and ways to maybe counteract that. The, the good news is that among our smaller sample of consumers that we ask, we've asked uh, about five times now uh, through the course of this year about if people are planning on getting vaccinated and the, the lines are going in the right direction. So the gold line uh, that we track is people that have already been vaccinated among our sample. The green line going down is the people that still um, want to get vaccinated or still plan to. The, the trouble there is that um, this uh, gray line on the chart has been pretty consistent. These are the folks that say they don't plan to get vaccinated. Um, it's not even the folks that are unsure, it's, it's the consumers that say no, I don't plan to, to get a vaccine. We looked at lots of reasons before. A couple of weeks ago, it had to do with, you know, uh, concern over side effects and things like that. But um, a big portion of the population is kind of immovable on this. And so the question that we ask, derived from that is, well, okay, so is the pandemic really over yet? If, if what we're looking at is, um, for the most part, the cases that we're seeing now from the Delta variant are primarily among folks that are still not vaccinated. And it's a, it's a choice of um, you know, being vaccinated or not. Where are we right now? Um, we asked folks kind of a, it was a binary choice. You know, is this crisis still not over because people aren't vaccinated? Or is it kind of over in effect because the people that are being affected are the ones that choose not to be vaccinated? And, and right now, uh, about three in five people say, no, we're, this is still not over. We, sh we still need to make every effort to convince people to get vaccinated, to still take precautions. Uh, we still have a ways to go before this can really be behind us. What's interesting to me 
is that we're seeing a real pretty uh, significant split. If you look at the consumers who have been vaccinated versus the ones who, uh, you know, say that they don't plan to get vaccinated, they're not even unsure. They just are pretty much set on refusing to be vaccinated. And the folks who, uh, you know, are statistically least at risk, the folks who have already been vaccinated are the ones saying, well, no, this isn't over yet. We need to do even more to, to get this uh, under control. And the folks that are saying, no, it's time to get back to normal. It, this is effectively over are the ones who have made the choice not to vaccinate themselves. We'll see this again a couple of times uh, in the slides today. So if you look at it state by state, um, we have tracked this a couple of times over the last few webinars. And one thing that you sort of see reading left to right, you know, these are the states that have the uh, highest rates of vaccination on the left side of the chart to the states that have the lowest rates of vaccination. And this is, you know, a percentage of citizens of that state. Um, you know, on the left side, there's the District of Columbia, there are some Northeastern states that have, you know, rolled up the vaccine and gotten uh, most of their people vaccinated. The right end of the chart, uh, the, those states tend to be concentrated more in the Southeast. And we'll come back to this chart a little bit later and kind of show it against how the restaurant industries are doing in those, in those states. But for right now, um, a lot of states luckily have a majority of people uh, vaccinated, but as you can see, it's kind of a, there's a long tail of, of states that um, are falling behind. And what that all kind of leads to is if it's a question of, you know, do we still do everything to combat this uh, public health crisis? Do we go forward trying to get the economy back on track? Um, it, it's obviously more nuanced than, than that, but for the duration of, of the pandemic, we've been asking it as a binary choice about just what are you more concerned with? Are you more concerned about the, you know, the public health crisis and the impact that has on our healthcare system, or are you more worried about the follow-on effects you know, and the, the detriment to the economy for the most part, this was this was uh, the public health crisis was winning, kind of going away for a long time. But in the past month, things had really shifted. Where you know it looked like we had this thing on the run. Delta variant wasn't in the news yet. Uh, vaccinations were rising, hadn't quite plateaued. So uh, before it looked like we were starting to think more about okay, let's let's take a look at the the next steps, getting the economy recovered. Uh, but these numbers are, are shifting a little bit back toward, toward the mean. It's 50-50 right now. We'll keep looking at this to see kind of how that goes. But, you know, the, the question now is that we have to look at what people want to do if COVID cases start rising in their area. And, and in most states, that is the case. Um, you know, cases are up in, in quite a few states, significantly in, in, uh, in some, but kind of depending on where you are, we still wanted to ask consumers, okay, if, if there is a, a pretty big surge in cases, what do you want to do? Do you think that we should go back toward locking down or do you think that we should, uh, you know, not quite go that far? And just like the last time there was about a three and five to two and five split of people uh, in terms of what they, what they agreed with. So for the most part, it's, it's uh, a majority of folks think that you know, we should go back to some lockdown measures of, maybe we should go back to dining room restrictions. Uh, certainly, you know, mask guidelines, things like that. And again, we're seeing kind of the same, the same split here where the folks who statistically, statistically are uh, least at risk because they have been vaccinated against uh, coronavirus and that these vaccines have proven pretty effective against the Delta variant. Um, those are the ones that are saying we need to do more. The, the folks refusing the vaccine are the ones that are saying, well, no, that time has passed. Um, we really can't go back to the height of our, of our lockdown measures. I said we were gonna look at this again, where um, from a few slides ago with those gold bars, we have it again here. So these white bars, again, are the states that uh, are leading left to right in vaccination rates. This blue line that you see there, um, those, that's the rate of uh, closures in their state tracked by our Firefly database. So uh, throughout this whole, this whole crisis, we have been uh, tracking the number of restaurants in each state that are temporarily or permanently closed. 
So this line here represents temporary plus permanently closed. Um, nationally, we're above, I think, 12% for the whole restaurant industry right now in terms of the restaurants that were open before coronavirus, 12% of them have uh, closed. And so looking at it another way, the blue dots on this chart show the states with uh, the highest rates of restaurant closures in their state. The green dots are the ones that are the six lowest rates of closure in their state. And so, uh, you know, one thing that is kind of counterintuitive and certainly interesting and a little bit concerning is that they don't really map as cleanly as you might think. Um, you know, I, I would have thought that the states that had the, you know, higher rates of vaccination would have the lower rates of closure, but um, it really isn't the case. In, in fact, you know, the District of Columbia, uh, you know, and some of these states are hard hit, you know, at the beginning, they have done a lot to get their people vaccinated, but they also weren't able to withstand the pressures of keeping restaurants closed. Um, now, you know, some of these things are um, a little bit idiosyncratic, you know, DC is a, is a, you know, government town, it's the seat of our government that is in the middle of a huge vaccination effort. Um, so obviously they're gonna be on the higher end of, of the vaccinated scale, but uh, still have trouble keeping their restaurants open. On the right side of this chart, you know, even in some of those southeastern states or uh, western states that um, haven't uh, been able to get as many people vaccinated as, as other states, they nonetheless have been able to open up their their uh, their restaurants at a higher rate. Um, so it's one thing that we have to kind of keep watching. It, it bears looking, you know, over the long term here, um, but it doesn't really. Uh, uh, correlate as cleanly as, as I might have thought. And what that all leads to is, uh, you know, our, our numbers we've tracked over the long term of concern and avoidant behavior, they have kind of spiked back up. Uh, we had some really, really great news the last few months where this was consistently falling, even, you know, sharply uh, falling in, in some cases. Our levels of concern for coronavirus had even dipped below uh, where they were at the start of the pandemic, but they're back up now. Um, you know, this is just one data point uh, a, a month apart. So we need to kind of make sure that we keep following this over the long term, and we will, and we'll update you guys as we as we do. But uh, for right now, we are just in a period where we have kind of taken a, a step back in, in terms of uh, consumer confidence that the pandemic is on the run. Uh, you know, same thing, like I said before, Unfortunately, there is a spike in avoidant behavior. This had also fallen to levels we hadn't seen since the start of the pandemic, but they are back up now. And if we're asking, you know, is this mostly because of the Delta variant? The answer, the answer is yes. Um, so we just asked consumers in this last survey how they felt about the spread of the Delta variant. There weren't many folks that were unaware. Um, and so for the most part, uh, we are talking about, um, you know, Rises, uh, you know, a rise of concern that is because of this one news event, um, this this Delta variant, and um, you know, again, what we've seen throughout this study is that the folks that are the most concerned are the ones that have kind of already um, taken proactive steps to keep themselves safe. So, um, the populations here that are um, even more uh, significantly likely to say that they're more concerned and more cautious folks in the Northeast, folks who have been vaccinated, folks who wanna still get vaccinated and boomers. So a lot of overlap uh, among all those populations um, and they are driving this number of people that say they're more concerned and they're more cautious. And so because of that, we asked those folks that said they're, they're kind of more on their guard for the Delta variant, well, what are you, what are you doing about it? And there are a couple of different things, a couple of different ways to ask that. Right, so there's what did you just kind of keep doing that you've been doing throughout the pandemic? What did you start doing? What are you really not going to start doing? So in terms of what people are, uh, you know, kind of continuing to do, these are their pandemic habits that they are just kind of keeping in place for right now. Obviously, we're all cooking at home a lot more. That shouldn't be any surprise. But a lot of our, um, you know, off-premise strategies for using restaurants are also showing a lot of staying power. So, um, and then so are our, our grocery buying habits as well. 
So people that are gonna just kind of keep opting for uh, takeout, for using the drive-through, for using delivery instead of going in, we're still gonna have that challenge. It'll be um, you know, a little bit harder to, for full service restaurants to uh, get people in the door uh, like we were hoping to at this point, at this point in the vaccine rollout. Um, and, and again, um, one thing that people are, are doing that's a pretty easy thing to kind of keep up is their grocery shopping strategies. So um, certainly avoiding crowds at the grocery store. Uh, some are gonna start turning to other strategies, um, but for the most part, the, the strategy that people are probably gonna find easiest to pick up is that idea of still doing your own grocery shopping, but just going at different times, times when you think that it won't be so crowded so that you can avoid uh, you know, being you know, in too much of a crowd. You look at the things that are on these red bars. Uh, I'm just pointing this out because um, it was interesting to me. I would have guessed that there would have been a little bit more trial, a little bit more pickup of this, uh, but it doesn't seem to be the case for uh, meal kits and grocery delivery. Um, and even not uh, alcohol delivery. You know, these are these are all things where millennials are going to um, index higher in, in terms of keep doing them, picking them up. Um, you know, I think that a lot of them are the ones that have, you know, kids in the home, and so it is just a little bit harder logistically for them to be, you know, outside of the house with those kinds of concerns. So they're going to pick up more of these off-premise grocery strategies or off-premise booze strategies. But um, for the most part, I think our patterns are largely set and there's not too many kinds of options that are gonna be kind of picked up for the first time. Uh, and so that, that kind of sheds light on, on this stat here, which is that most of us feel like we're kind of already set in our new patterns for what normal is right now. We're, if we call right now kind of a post-pandemic period, at least that's how this question was asked, uh, more often than not, folks are feeling kind of set with, with how they are gonna do things in the, in the near term. What was pretty interesting here, for me at least, was that uh, here is where, the, the, so there's no real significant difference between the vaccinated and the vaccine refusers. Um, and the only folks that really flip this finding on its head is the population of folks that are still kind of not sure whether or not they're gonna get the vaccine. They haven't ruled it out completely. They still are trying to learn more and kind of work through that themselves. The uncertain folks are the ones who uh, are the majority that'll, that'll say um, they're still waiting for the pandemic to end and they can't feel set in their routines yet. The other folks, whether they're vaccinated or not, um, are more likely to feel set in their kind of post-pandemic new normal. And that leads to kind of the, just the last, the last thing that we can really ask about right now at this moment, which is, okay, if we start to re-implement some of our uh, you know, COVID era guidelines for um, dining in at restaurants, what's the, you know, what's the uh, adoption or pushback gonna be? And uh, the, the good news is that for the most part, um, a lot of consumers, if you ask them to wear a mask to, to dine in, at least before they're sat, before they're sat um, I think that a lot of consumers kind of recognize that, yeah, this, this is something that, that helps me or helps other people I can comply with that. You get very, very few folks who, uh, you know, would leave the restaurant and just sort of never come back again, you know, make me wear a mask. Uh, and there's even a, a very um, good percentage of folks that would still work with the restaurant, find a different way to use them, find a different way to order from them. So if they're not gonna dine in, they'll get some to go, they'll get something delivered. Um, so the, the um, compliance and the stickiness of mask wearing is, is pretty high. It's a different story when we ask about showing proof of vaccination as another method to keep uh, everybody safe uh, right, right now with the Delta variant spreading. So um, about half the folks would um, you know, comply, show proof of vaccination if they had it, if they were asked to, uh, but the, you know, the customer defection definitely uh, you know, rises and even could be, you know, long-term and permanent if we're talking about um, a vaccine passport or proof of vaccination versus just being asked to wear a mask. Um, and I want to do one more kind of call out here uh, just to show that even among 
the consumers who are not sure about getting vaccinated or have decided not to, um, it also makes a difference with these folks. If you're just asking for um, them to wear a mask versus asking for proof of vaccination, something they might feel is a little bit more invasive. Um, the, you know, the, the difference between the uncertain folks and the vaccine, ref, you know, refusers is, is um, kind of non-existent when it comes to mask wearing. Uh, it rises for both uh, of those groups when we go from wearing masks to showing proof. Um, and really, um, you risk um, losing a lot of customers for the long term if you go with that method, if those customers have kind of made up their minds not to get vaccinated. So what it all kind of, what it all kind of leads to is um, we're just going to see kind of the enduring importance of more uh, off-premise strategies. Uh, so that means we might be looking toward uh, maybe uh, more digital ordering, more um, certainly digital marketing, uh, some automation in the front of the house, in the back of the house. And so we need to take a, a closer look at that, which is why, luckily for us, uh, Gerald Lokesen is with us. He is the um, principal author of one of our newest reports here, the, the Restaurant of the Future keynote from Data Central. Uh, we did a very, very large survey with um, not only consumers, but also operators on the kinds of automation, technology, you know, digital strategies that uh, they have been implementing recently. A lot of it is, you know, uh, within the context of, of COVID, but um, we also compared it with uh, the same kind of a survey that we ran two years ago. You know, just back then, of course, none of us really knew um, or could have foreseen what this period of, of our country's history was like. Um, you know, that was just about, you know, what kind of cool new technology and, and ways to, you know, engage with the customer you're looking at. Um, those were just like kind of cool new things back then. Now they're even more necessary than ever. So that comparison is, is going to be really, really interesting to look at. So I'm glad that, glad that you're here, Jared. Do you want to uh, get us started uh, on, on your findings? Yes, thank you, Mark. All right, everyone, um, I'm going to take us into the future. And just like Mark said, these came from our Restaurant of the Future keynote, which dropped earlier this month. And like Mark said, you know, our primary goal with this one was to envision just what tomorrow's restaurant is going to look like. So to kick this off, um, you know, pretty much exposure to automation and food service among consumers has exploded. Um, and even in just in the last two years, and in many ways, the pandemic greatly accelerated this. Like we saw earlier, we saw tons of people utilizing way more grocery and food service delivery. And then many of them were using these services for the first time because they kind of had to. Um, so here we gauge consumer affinity and perception on automation's role in the restaurant experience. And we trended this with 2019 data. So just two years, just to see if there was any major shifts. And overall, what we see is that in general, consumer perception of automation is relatively positive. Um, and so is it when it comes to its role in the uh, restaurant experience. And I think, you know, the main takeaway here is just that these perception and affinities, they just increased massively in just two years in this time frame. And I think that's right, especially since, uh, you know, you look at the people that say it has always improved the experience of dining out. I mean, that doubled in, in two years. That's a pretty significant finding, I think. Definitely. And, and one other thing I should mention, too, is that our definition of automa automation here is pretty broad. Um, it's basically anything that expedites the consumer experience when eating out. So it can be like mobile app ordering on your phone, QR code menus, and then even like contactless payments. Okay, and this slide actually really surprised me. So here we have consumer usage of and interest in using of mobile food apps. And currently three quarters of consumers overall use mobile food apps to some extent. And then an additional one in 10 are interested in doing so. And just like the last slide we see, and then we'll see this on the next slide too, just massive jumps in um, adoption towards more tech savviness amongst consumers just in two years. And it's really neat to see just in particular, just how much heavy and moderate food app users have grown in this time frame too. Okay, and this is a good one. And this one is also very relevant to the current labor shortage. So 
On this one, we as consumers also trended with 2019. How do you feel about backup house automation and how do you feel about it replacing human jobs? And we actually see that um, playing right out here on this slide with this robot taping this man's briefcase and he's not sure how to take it. But all in all, basically we see that affinity for back of house automation has grown notably, but so is the concern on the effects these technologies may have when it comes to replacing people's jobs. And Jared, how do we just, how do we kind of describe, you know, what, what back of house automation would, would look like? Is it like robot fry cooks and stuff like that, or just like kitchen management systems? How does, how did that, how is that described? It's a great question. And it's both of those things. So again, it's basically anything that just expedites the experience. So what White Castles, for example, just got in a few of their stores, um, robots from Miso Robotics and they're full on fry cooks now in those restaurants, but it can also be like a POS system from a company like Square um, that not only can you change your menu prices with it, you can integrate with third party delivery apps and then also keep track of all your inventory. So just tons of different technologies in the back of the house. Okay, and here on this one, we see factors that spurred why operators added automation to their restaurants. And then this one again is trended with 2019. And, you know, just like I mentioned on the last slide, the current labor shortage is definitely playing a role here. Um, factors like a limited labor pool, improving employee morale, and high employee turnover, all are more prominent motivators this year compared to just two years ago. And then another thing that's also kind of cool to see here, or maybe not cool, but the coolness factor has decreased in just two years. And I think that's probably not too surprising. I mean, we all have smartphones in our pockets that can do you know, pretty incredible things that I think just in general, people are becoming more you know, familiar with technology being a major part of their lives. Yeah, I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like what mm -hmm. was cool yesterday is kind of expected now. Yeah, we're gonna need the robots to think things are cool soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but for these next ones, we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna look a little bit deeper at consumers and technology. Okay, and I think this one's pretty fascinating. So here we ask consumers, what percent of your average purchases from food service were consumed off premise versus on premise over the last year? And what we found is that well over half of everything purchased from food service was actually consumed off premise over the last year. And really this isn't too surprising considering coronavirus, but Still pretty crazy to see. Um, did, you, did you guys anticipate seeing a number like this? No, I mean, I, I, I knew that it was probably going to be less than half um, on premise just because dining rooms are closed so much. Uh, but, you know, even even kind of a 60 40 split that that seemed a little high to me, but but it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Okay, and then this one's kind of similar to this last one, um, and really just because it's so impactful to see. So here we asked for among all consumers, from your orders over the last year from food service, what percent were placed digitally versus not digitally? And you know, I think this is just staggering to see. Um, I remember just even five years ago how e-commerce was talked about was just completely different, and just to see it like just under half a percent of all orders is it's pretty incredible. Um, and then also there's a lot of tailwinds here too, because we also ask consumers over the upcoming uh, two years, do you anticipate, like, how do you anticipate ordering? And, you know, the vast majority of them say that they're gonna either stay the same rate of their digital ordering or they're gonna actually increase it. So, um, you know, the trend's definitely just gonna continue and digital ordering is gonna eat more of that share. And and another thing too, actually, it's younger consumers are really the ones driving this too, all these digital orderings. Right, which, which makes, makes total sense. Yeah. Okay, and this is a good con consumer perception one. So for this one, we ask consumers, what level of automation would you say the restaurants you visit incorporate? Also trended with 2019. And, you know, again, like I said earlier, just consumer exposure to automation food service just exploded. Now more than nine out of 10 uh, consumers have visited restaurants that have some form of automation. And then, you know, this has just grown like crazy in the last two years. Yeah, well, and, and again, that, that makes perfect sense too, given how broadly we define automation and kind of how easy it is to really bring in 
you know, little touches here and there. You don't have to remake your restaurant overnight. Okay, and this is a cool one. Um, on this slide and the next one, we're gonna look at some cool FinTech consumer insights. So here we see the utilization of digital payments by consumers pertaining to food service. And again, but the last time I'll say it today, we have massive jumps in just two years when it comes to consumers adopting these things. Um, overall, it's like the contactless payments that have the most consumer adoption. And you know, these are the types of things that definitely had to come in handy over the last year, especially. But to me, I was actually really surprised to see how high the private companies um, adoption of payments are, you know, the Google Pay, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay. Do you guys use any of these things? Like I'm, I'm still struggling with a chip reader, I feel like. <laughs> I mean, I, I, use, I use Apple Pay sometimes, um, but you know, for the, for the most part, you're gonna, it's gonna be limited to whatever your smartphone maker is sometimes, right? So good... like I've, I've got no reason to ever use Android or Samsung if I have an Apple phone. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I couldn't see myself doing it, but maybe, maybe if it becomes super convenient and I'm sure it actually is pretty convenient. Okay, but we can't talk about FinTech and then not look at crypto cryptocurrency. And this is something I totally called last year and predicted, but I was actually really surprised to see how high current consumer adoption is. So we see basically one in five consumers have already used cryptocurrency to buy food or beverages. And then, you know, another almost 30% are interested in doing so. Um, you know, and I think just in general, this is one thing that's worthy of being on the radar. I saw that, like, I think it's the, the Pacers, you can buy dope buy tickets to a Pacers game with Doge coins. So it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, I was skeptical for a long time, but now I'm kind of a believer, I think, in crypto. I was gonna say, you, you, do you have any crypto, Jared? I thought you had some. Yeah, some Bitcoin. It's been a wild ride, I don't know. Um, and I always think of, I think it was a story in the Washington Post, maybe like eight years ago or something. Someone paid like eight Bitcoins to buy sushi and what would that be? That'd be like $400,000 a few months ago. So yeah, I hope, like, I hope it was good. <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. And so, you know, crypto is probably the future, but we also asked about, um, you know, just what, what uh, consumers' actual plans were for how they think they want to eat over the next couple of years here. So this was interesting to me too. And I just saw Dale, you asked a question to see, it would be cool to uh, see the cryptocurrency adoption by generation. And we do have that in the keynote and it's very interesting. Um, and definitely there's a lot of generational skews when it comes to that. But um, to wrap things up before I hand it over to Carly. So just like Mark said, here we asked, what are these cool things do you anticipate doing more over the upcoming two years for consumers? And Overall, this is you know kind of a good peek into the keynote overall of some of the cool things we looked at, and I think you know the main thing here is the great enthusiasm we see for some of these cutting edge trends like eating insects, lab grown meat, and you know one thing I think is worthy of being on the radar too, but maybe still several years out is geno genomic DNA diets. Um, but I think you know still the technology has some ways to go on that before it's really viable, but. Um, you know, just like I was saying too with the cryptocurrency, another thing is that a lot of this is very generationally skewed. So millennials in general are very gung-ho for a lot of these things. But, um, you know, in general, and actually this is a good segue to Carly, but the top anticipated behavior we saw here is that more than a third of consumers overall anticipate eating new menu items, things they've never tried before. That's right, and and there's also a fair amount here that want, you know, regional cuisine and global cuisine. Which, you're right, it really kind of is the perfect uh, perfect transition to Carly. Yeah, so um, let's talk about a cuisine that we're starting to see um, emerge a little bit. And you know, as Jared pointed out, people just really want to try new things. We've been seeing that consistently over and over in the data. Um, Mark, I think, let me know if you would agree, but you know, since the beginning of COVID, people want to go out and they want to try new things. They're looking forward to it. And it's been really hard to do that with restaurants closed because that's the main avenue of food discovery for a lot of people. 
Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk about a cuisine that's um, near and dear to my heart, Eastern European cuisine. And um, we have a map here that I um, very poorly filled in with an approximate area of where Eastern Europe is. And we have a list of some of the countries that you could um, consider to be part of Eastern Europe. And, you know, overall, um, you know, the, the definition changes, but this is just some of the cuisines that we can start to think about. Um, and we're gonna talk about some um, dishes and condiments of the cuisine and highlight some cool restaurants. But I wanna talk about um, a, a lot of what's driving the interest in this cuisine. Um, and a lot of it is um, children of immigrants um, who are rediscovering the cuisine. They want to um, eat the food that they ate growing up that their parents brought from the home country. Um, and this region has seen a lot of turmoil in the past hundred plus years too. So a lot of that um, is people, including my own family who came to America um, and wanted, and the younger generations are now wanting to rediscover these traditions and keep them alive. Um, so the first uh, thing we want to talk about is Ivar. Um, Ivar is, um, and a lot of these are found um, throughout the region in kind of different forms. Um, Ivar is a red pepper and garlic sauce, um, and I believe Ivar is um, the Croatian pronunciation. And um, Ivar is really interesting. We're starting to see it appear on menus. And if we flip to the next slide, you can actually buy a version of it on the Georgian Ajika at Trader Joe's now if you want to try it. So already we're starting to see some of this pop into retail. The next dish I want to highlight is called shashlik, um, and this is actually growing on menus. Only a handful of restaurants offer it, but it's grown by 200% over the past four years. And shashlik is from Russian, Russia and Central Asia. It's grilled and marinated meat on skewers, kind of similar to kebab. Um, onions are key to the marinade, and depending on the region, it can be served with veggies and different sauces and things like that. Uh, the next dish we've actually talked about before, it's hachapuri, um, and it is actually the national dish of Georgia. So um, this is like, I think, more of a traditional Georgian presentation where you have the running egg yolk and the warm cheese, and you kind of tear off pieces of the bread and swirl that egg yolk in. Um, some countries and some regions um, don't spread it with the egg, it's just the cheese and bread. But either way, we actually covered this in 2017 in our On the Menu publication. Um, I've had this before, it's delicious. It's a really experiential dish, and um, if you look at the ingredients, you know, they're not, they're pretty approachable for most people too. So this is another one to keep an eye on. Uh, the next dish we want to highlight is called chivapi. Um, they're grilled caseless sausages, and they're actually the national dish of Bosnia um, and Herzegovina. And it's a typical street food that's often served with flatbread and actually Ivar, and you can see that in the picture here. Um, it's also commonly served with fries and roasted potatoes too. The next two dishes we're gonna highlight um, are a little bit more well-known and um, that's interesting because we're actually starting to see some twists on them on menus. So this is paprikash um, and we're also seeing some menu growth with this one too. Um, it's, hung it's from Hungary and um, it's named for its key use of paprika which gives it that really traditional, you know, like red, beautiful hue. It's often served with boiled egg noodles that are similar in style and shape to spatzel, but you can also serve it with um, tagliatelle, rice and uh, other grains. And we have an operator um, in Ohio called Melt Bar and Grill that's actually serving a chicken paprikash mac and cheese. So again, you know, go, going back to Indian pizza, thinking of like these fusion dishes and how they evolve and adapt. The next one I know is near and dear to Mike's heart, it's pierogi. Um, and we're seeing, you know, pierogi, um, classic comfort food, um, even here in America, I would say it's a classic comfort food. And we're seeing operators um, evolve and, you know, add new twists on it. And this one's really interesting because this is a ghost kitchen that actually came about because of COVID. Uh, it's called Zofia's Kitchen in Arlington, Virginia. So we had um, a chef, uh, Ed Hardy, you know, was looking for something to do. His friend asked him to make some pierogies for the barbecue and he went all out. He um, filled them with kind of mashup fixings. Um, and it was such a hit that it actually became a ghost kitchen. So if you're in Arlington or the DC area, you can actually order from Sophia's Kitchen. Um, these are their everything bagel pierogies and this is their crab rangoon pierogi. And they also have um, some other things like Reuben sandwiches and latke donuts. Um, so latkes are a key part of Ashkenazi Jewish cuisine, which also comes from the region. And latkes are also something that we've seen growing on menus too. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we can actually see um, from Snooze Kitchen, which is um, a you know upscale breakfast restaurant with a number of locations. Um, they actually have a um, latke and lox Benedict, where the latkes are actually um, take the place of English muffins. 
And then um, let's talk about how this is playing out in restaurants. This is Kochka in Portland. Um, and if you have the opportunity to go here, wow, do not run. This restaurant is incredible. Um, and Kochka is um, a Russian restaurant. And um, if we go to the next slide, we can see the chef Bonnie Morales. And Bonnie has a really interesting story. She's the daughter of Russian Jews that immigrated from the Soviet Union to America. And she grew up with Belarusian cuisine and later went to culinary school. Um, she kind of avoided her heritage. She talks about how she came back. She went to French culinary school and she like wanted to, you know, like make all these dishes feel more upscale. And as she was trying to do that, she realized they were really good just the way they are and they're um, balanced. And she says that the food she cooks isn't just about a cuisine. It's about her family and honoring the journey that took us to the U.S. And for a lot of people who cook this cuisine and who have chosen to open restaurants, you'll hear that thread kind of echoed. Kashka is actually named after her Jewish grandmother who fled execution in her hometown by the Nazis. Um, she was stopped by a German soldier and asked to prove that she was not Jewish by saying duck in Ukrainian. And she guessed the Belarusian and Yiddish word for duck would be the same as it was in Ukrainian, which was Kachka. And so the restaurant itself is named and, um, you know, to respect that journey of her family. And here are some dishes at Kashka. Um, this is herring under a fur coat, and it's actually one of the most famous dishes at Kashka. You can see it's absolutely beautiful. Um, she actually calls it a seven layer dip, but Russian. And uh, she said she was actually kind of afraid to put this on the menu because um, the ingredients can be a little daunting. It's a classic dish in the Soviet Union. Um, it's got beets, which you can see there, and actually will go top to bottom. So it's Yukon potatoes, pickled herring, which was um, my dad's favorite snack and is a, uh, you know, pretty daunting. <laughs> um, <laughs> carrot, uh, onion, dill, mayo, and hard boiled egg at the top. And, you know, she was afraid to put this dish on the menu because it's got so many unfamiliar flavors, but people love it. And if you go on Instagram, it's actually, I think, one of the most popular dishes because you can just see it's beautiful. They also have pelmeni, um, which are Russian dumplings, and they're served with sour cream and butter. They actually have a dumpling and vodka happy hour, if you can make it there. That's just phenomenal. And again, really hearty, really delicious. The next restaurant I want to talk about is called Rosemary in Chicago. It just opened, and it's an Italian and Croatian fusion restaurant. And again, this was inspired by familial heritage. Um, the chef behind this is actually top chef winner Joe Flam. So he has a ton of expertise in Italian cooking. One of his grandmothers is actually Italian, um, and the restaurant is named for his two grandmothers, Rose and Mary. Um, and he was also really inspired by his wife's Croatian heritage. And one of the dishes on the menu is cool roasted beets. And this is really interesting because the bottom of the dish, dish is kajmak or kmak, which is a cheese found all throughout Eastern Europe, especially in like Serbia, Croatia, and Macedonia. And it can actually be used as an appetizer or even a condiment. And here we can see it doing kind of both. And then finally taking a look at his menu and I encourage you to go take a look. We can see, you know, that really interesting like fusion, some classic Italian stuff, some classic Croatian stuff. But if we scroll down the menu, we can see at the bottom here, he's got chivapi and he's serving it with Ivar. So this stuff is just beginning to appear on menus. Um, it's really delicious. It's, you know, got a fascinating history and story and um, we encourage you to keep an eye on it. That's great. We will keep an eye on it. Um, and everybody, we are ending right on time. So uh, we thank you guys for sticking around with us for, for the whole hour today. We know that uh, summer vacations are getting, getting started. So, um, if we don't see you uh, in two weeks for August 5th, we hope that you guys come back after that um, and enjoy the rest of your summers here. Uh, we will keep you guys up to date um, as much as we can on all these new uh, happenings with, with uh, not only coronavirus and, and the effect on restaurants, but like Carly just showed, lots of emerging uh, culinary trends, something that Mike finds interesting, uh, technology, the whole bit. So we hope that we see you guys here uh, every other Thursday at uh, noon central time. Uh, you'll have Jack next time, I'm sure. Um, and thanks so much for sticking with us.